I'm David Brownlee. I teach architectural history at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm a member of the board of the Beth Shalom Preservation Foundation. I'd like to talk to about one of the most interesting aspects of the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, and that's his use of geometry, sometimes exceedingly complicated geometry, which he felt quite certainly brought his architecture to life, that gave it energy. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright's geometry can be very complicated, and at Beth Shalom, to be sure, we find a, a, what is essentially a geometrical puzzle, a building that asks you to guess what its shape is. What is its shape? Well, it's very difficult to say, to define it exactly, unless you look at it from an unusual vantage point, like straight above. If you do that, you will see that the composition is essentially a simple one, composed of a, a triangle, uh, which reflects the great tripod of steel legs that holds up the roof, and uh, that, tri that triangle is uh, circumscribed by an irregular hexagon, uh, a hexagon which is aligned with the exterior walls of the building. The intersection of these two simple geometric forms creates all the complicated geometry that we see around us. Frankly, Wright was fascinated by geometry in, uh, in, uh, throughout his work, throughout his career, um, and in all aspects of his work, including the decorative arts. And at Beth Shalom, we certainly see his experiments with geometry in the lighting fixtures and preeminently in the great chandelier that hangs above the sanctuary. Um, where did he learn this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, <laughs> this kind of, of architectural design based on complicated geometry? Well, I think he learned it working with, uh, with Lewis Sullivan. Um, he was in Sullivan's office in Chicago uh, from, uh, from 1898 until, uh, until uh, from 1888 until 1893. And while he was there, Sullivan designed some of his greatest buildings, including the Wainwright Building in St. Louis that you see on the right-hand side. Um, we know that Frank Lloyd Wright worked on the Wainwright Building, and it's quite clear that he was the draftsman who created the decorative ornament that we think of as distinctively Louis Sullivan ornament, but in fact drawn by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, the, uh, the character of this ornament ornament is, uh, is defined by its reliance on underlying, uh, underlying geometry that Sol in Sullivan's hands literally comes to life, literally sprouts flowers. Um, Sullivan explained how this worked. Uh, this worked in a book that he, that he created towards the end of his life in the 1920s. Um, as the diagram at the top left shows, he believed that composition of, the composition of an ornament began with the layering of simple geometric forms to create increasing complexity and that, com that the energy of that complexity uh, gave, uh, gave birth to uh, what was in his hands, a literally floral ornamental pattern, botanical patterns like, like that which you see at the bottom right uh, in this, on the page on the left and in the big detail on the right hand side. Frank Lloyd Wright took this kind of ornament with him from Sullivan's office to his own first independent work. Uh, this is the Winslow House in uh, the suburb of River Forest outside Chicago of 1893. And you can see that Frank Lloyd Wright in this first building that he built on his own, uh, wrapped the second floor with a band of terracotta, which had been uh, molded with, well, we would call it Sullivanian ornament, um, ornament in which geometry is brought to life with botanical representation. By, the by 1900 or so, by the time Frank Lloyd Wright had begun to develop what came to be called the prairie style in domestic architecture for the Chicago suburbs, uh, the botanical forms have dropped away. And Frank Lloyd Wright's ornament at this point becomes more purely and abstractly geometrical. Um, uh, you can see that in the pattern uh, in the ceiling of the stair hall of the Willits House on the left-hand side, uh, where, bat where uh, dark stained wood battens uh, make a very strong geometric pattern against a plaster, a plaster ceiling. And you can see it in the diamond-shaped skylight that is framed by those battens, a detail of which is on the right-hand side, uh, in which the forms of, uh, of nature have been rectangularized. Uh, in which the geometry of uh, inorganic, of the inorganic has, be, uh, has predominated, but it's still an energetic composition, um, energized by diagonals um, and by color. Uh, and Frank Lloyd Wright would continue to experiment with abstract geometry brought to life in a variety of ways. Uh, we see that too in the stained glass clerestory windows of the so-called Coonley Playhouse, really a small school in Riverside, another suburb of Chicago from 1912. 
Uh, in the 1920s, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright became very much preoccupied with the introduction of diagonals, energizing diagonals into his architecture. Um, this occurred quite certainly under the influence of his work in Arizona. Uh, beginning in 1927, um, he began an annual uh, ritual of taking his apprentices and his employees uh, and taking them from Chile, uh, Wisconsin, where he had built a home at Taliesin in 1911, taking them every winter to Arizona. At first, they set up a temporary camp for several years uh, near Chandler, Arizona, called the Okatia Camp, a camp of wooden and canvas structures, uh, temporary structures, every feature of which was diagonal in plan and in elevation, um, energized, uh, I, I think Frank Light, Roy, I believe Frank Lloyd Wright believed by that geometry. It may have been inspired by the profiles of the surrounding mountains or perhaps by the spiky cacti, uh, but whatever the inspiration was, the effect was an energized geometric uh, geometry of diagonals. And Frank Lloyd Wright made that, that diagonal energy permanent when he in 1937 began to build a permanent base in Arizona near Scottsdale, the complex of buildings that he called Taliesin West. Um, there you see in permanent materials the same energetic diagonality. In the 1930s and 1940s, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, built a lot of houses, some quite small houses, some larger houses, like this one for the Hannas, uh, for uh, Paul and Jean Hanna, who were child psychologists at Stanford University. And he sought to differentiate these houses one from another by the use of geometry. For the Hannah house, you can see that the differentiating geometry is the hexagon. Uh, the hexagon is the module for the entire design and was literally incised in the poured concrete slab on which the house was built, as you can see in the plan on the left hand side. And uh, diagonals repeated and repeated and repeated created a house uh, and, and uh, uh, created a house, uh, the repetition of that module of the, of the hexagon created a house that was in its totality a hexagon, as you see on the right hand side, um, and which gave the house the nickname of the honeycomb house based on the, uh, uh, the hexagonality if you will, of, of honeycombs. Um, that reference to organic nature is important. Um, and Frank Lloyd Wright um, uh, frequently in the latter part of his career uh, looked to organic nature or to nature more generally uh, for, the, uh, for the inspiration of his geometry. Um, it's to astronomy that he looks for the organizing geometry of the so-called solar hemicycle house that he built for the journalist Herbert, J Herbert Jacobs in Middleton, Wisconsin in 1943. There the house is is organized um, according to the degrees of arc of the sun's passage across the southern sky. The house is designed to absorb the, the warmth of the sun on winter days when the sun is low in the sky, uh, but be shielded from the hot summer sun by the, art, by the flat roof that you see above the windows on the left hand side. Um, that kind of organized and that kind of natural organizing geometry uh, is even more potently visible in the Guggenheim Museum, where the inspiration in this case is from organic nature, um, from the spiral seashells that you see x-rayed uh, on the bottom, which certainly inspired the great spiral uh, form and the structure of the Guggenheim Museum. Um, I think it's also true uh, the, the, uh, that we can find some naturalistic influence in the design of Beth Shalom. Although it's the prismatic uh, uh, geometry of rock crystals, not the curvilinear geometry of seashells that we see when we look at Beth Shalom. It's geology, not zoology, that brings energy to the design of Beth Shalom. Thanks for listening.